Hello everyone and welcome back to the Tank Encyclopedia. Today we will continue our in-depth look at the T-62 Soviet main battle tank. In this episode we will examine and discuss its structural design, its layout, how the crew fought in it, and its revolutionary 115mm smoothbore gun. This video is a collaboration with the Tankograd website, so do make sure to check it out as well if you want to learn more about Soviet Cold War armor. But before that, a short announcement from ourselves. After a long break, we're finally back with a brand new 8th issue of Tank Encyclopedia magazine. What took us so long? Well, we needed to make a few necessary steps to make our work official, and we made it. Starting from issue number 8, the magazine will be listed in the international libraries and databases, as we now have an ISSN, which will allow everyone to reference or cite our articles, and also has the potential to improve our visibility beyond the tank community. But what's inside issue number 8? Five amazing articles, starting with the Ford 3-ton special tractor, a rare vehicle conceived during the Great War. Then the stories of two Italian armored cars, the Semovente de 4732 su scaffo AB41 and the Panzersperwagen AB41201I. But the true gem of issue number 8 is the story of the FV4501 mine-clearing vehicle. The article features unpublished archive research and images. Don't miss it. Finally, we have the story of an M2010 8x8 armored personnel carrier. Researching North Korean vehicles has always been challenging, but we did our best. Probably the most amazing news is that issue number 8 is absolutely free, now and forever. We want to celebrate our achievements and have decided to share issue number 8 with you as a sign of our love and gratitude. Moreover, all our magazines are 10% off during the summer with the discount code 10 summer. Visit our store, grab your copy, and spread the word. But wait, there's more! Remember our first printed book? It's now available in our online store, and you have a chance to buy your own printed copy. The number of copies is limited, so don't miss this chance. And now, back to the T-62. Externally, the T-62 is often mistaken for a T-55, and not without reason. As we examined previously, the hull of the T-62 was a stretched out rendition of the T-55 hull, and its turret was very similar to that of the Object 140. Inside, most of the familiar equipment from a T-55 was present, just arranged differently. The total degree of unification between the T-62 and T-55 was 65%, although to the crew it might have seemed higher. Most of the parts inside and outside that couldn't be unified were still functionally identical. Some of these differences came about due to the new gun, and others came about due to differences in the hull and the turret structure itself. For example, mundane details like the control rods for the steering and gearbox, the air and fuel lines, the floor panels in the fighting compartment, and much of the wiring were practically the same as in a T-55, but because the T-62 hull was longer, all of these had to be lengthened. Aside from its length, another noteworthy change from the T-55 hull was the hull roof being tilted forwards by 0.5 degrees and the engine deck tilted backwards at 3.25 degrees. This shape was inherited from the design of the Object 140's hull, and its purpose was to increase forward gun depression and permit rearward gun depression by offsetting the low bore axis. For the driver who sat on the left side of the hull, a T-62 was essentially the same as a T-55. None of the structural changes introduced in the T-62 hull affected the driver's station in a significant way. The turret was a single-piece casting of medium hardness steel with a distinctly round shape, forming a perfect circle from a top view. The design of the turret was very close to the turret of the Object 140, mainly differing in that it had thinner armor, its roof was cast together with the rest of the turret rather than having the roof plate as a separately welded piece, and the commander's cupola being molded into the contours of the turret rather than being a separate bolt-on structure. The main highlight of the T-62 turret was its immense turret ring diameter of 2,245mm or 88.4 inches. This was larger than even the enormous 85-inch turret rings on American tanks like the M60 and M103. Of course, being smaller in height, the T-62 turret was nowhere near as spacious. Inside the crew compartment, a T-62 had a 1.2 cubic meters of extra internal volume compared to a T-55. 
The larger turret was only partly responsible for the extra space. Two-thirds of the additional volume inside the T-62 actually came from the extended hull. Most of this volume became extra space for the crew, even at the expense of other considerations like the tank's ammunition load. The T-62 hull had the same layout and ammunition placement as the T-55 hull, but its turret had the ammunition and equipment layout of the Object 140 turret. By using the hull layout of the T-55, several pitfalls of the Object 140 design were avoided. In order to meet the tactical, technical requirements set by the military, the Object 140 had to carry at least 50 rounds of main gun ammunition, and one of the measures undertaken to meet this requirement was to add an additional ammunition rack next to the recoil guard of the main gun. This would rotate with the floor, and the loader could use this as a ready rack. The idea of stowing ammunition on the rotating floor of a turret was by no means new, and in some tanks, like the Centurion, it was the only supply of ready ammunition. However, stowing ammunition this way had an obvious downside. The loader's working space became extremely narrow. Even when emptied, the racks took up space and were a snagging hazard to the loader. In tanks like the Centurion and the Leopard 1, the ready racks lined the circumference of the rotating floor rather than being next to the gun, which meant that after being emptied, the racks became a nuisance to the loader when he had to extract rounds from the hull. Inside the turret, the crew sat in a classical layout with a loader on the right. The equipment layout from the Object 140 turret was largely preserved save for the gunner's station. The T-62 gunner had the same type of telescopic day sight as a T-55, instead of the advanced periscopic sight on the previous project, and a periscopic night sight, which required an IR spotlight to function. He could control the turret with stabilized power controls or with manual backups. At its roots, the gunner's position being on the left of the gun was inherited from the standard field artillery design practices. There is hardly any information in the existing literature to explain why this was preferred in Soviet tank design. The simplest explanation is that it simply meshed well with the pre-existing Soviet policy of placing the driver on the left side. The same is in automobiles, and the industry had no incentive to change it. The commander's station was almost identical to the one in an Object 140, except that the cupola now had a large steel rung for the commander to hold onto when sitting inside or standing outside his hatch. The commander also had night vision capability provided by a combined day-night main periscope which could be used to designate targets for the gunner. He was responsible for operating the tank's R113 radio station, fitted on the turret ring next to the gunner seat. The policy of placing the radio within easy reach of the commander made it unnecessary to give him a separate channel switch box, like in most tanks with the radio in a turret bustle. In the tanks of platoon leaders and company leaders, a second radio was fitted to link unit leaders together, and also to link them to the infantry. The loader was the operator for the second radio. Having two radios permitted the commander to listen on one frequency with one radio, and communicate on a different frequency with the other radio at the same time. If the commander was standing out of an open hatch, as he normally would be during a march, he could get the gunner or loader to switch channels for him. Beginning in 1965, the R113 radio was replaced with the R123. The R123 had a vastly larger frequency range than the R113, large enough to communicate with the infantry's R105 field radios. This was not exactly a groundbreaking new capability, as Soviet infantry could already talk to the tanks attached to their unit via their own R113 radios in their BTRs. But nevertheless, it gave a dismounted Soviet infantry company headquarters an extra avenue of communication with tank unit leaders. For any infantrymen following closely behind a T-62, talking with the commander was only possible with raised voices. The commander's forward opening hatch was crucial here, shielding him from bullets as he talked to soldiers next to or behind his tank. The T-62 had no infantry telephone, only an external headset connected to the intercom intended for tank riders. If an infantry squad rode on top of the tank, the squad leader could wear this headset to talk to the crew, helping to direct the tank, call out enemy positions, and to coordinate where to dismount. The loader performed his duties while standing on a rotating floor, but unlike on the T-54, T-55, or the Object 140, his seat was fixed to the turret, 
positioning the loader to use his rotating periscope or operate the second radio if present. The loader's seat in a T-54 or Object 140 could be mounted in the same position, but they also had access to a second position further back, directly underneath the loader's hatch, so that he could stand on his seat and man the anti-aircraft machine gun. In a T-62, the loader's ready racks were in the front of the hull. Almost all of the armor-piercing rounds were stowed here, while the other ammunition racks were stocked with the HE frag rounds. As such, the ability of a T-62 to fight with its turret aimed to the sides or rear was much more situational than in most other tanks. For food and water, Soviet tankers depended on the traditional model of a field supply via a battalion-level field kitchen. It was expected that crews would have two hot meals a day delivered to them, typically in the morning and late at night. Between hot meals, the tankers had a ration of bread with canned meat from the morning delivery. Having long-term stores of provisions was not a design consideration, but nevertheless, eight packs of 24-hour individual dry rations were carried on board in case the food supply was interrupted. All of the main courses in the dry rations were canned and could be eaten cold or reheated by improvised means. Opening the radiators and placing the cans in the engine compartment was one reliable method, as the air temperature inside was up to 100 degrees Celsius. The crew compartment had strong ventilation thanks to a negative pressure system commonly found on tanks after World War II. A ventilation blower on the rear of the turret supplied fresh air, filtered from dust and moisture, but the airflow mainly came from a large exhaust fan embedded in the engine compartment partition. This fan kept air flowing through the crew compartment continuously, and as the engine revved up, the cooling fan increased the pressure differential between the crew compartment and the engine compartment, further accelerating the airflow. Fundamentally, this was no different than how air was moved through the crew compartment of a T-54, except that a T-62 was sealed more tightly, so most of the air entered through the ventilator. One caveat to this method of ventilation is that it could not be used in a nuclear-contaminated environment. When the tank locks down after a nuclear detonation is detected, a positive pressure system must be used. With all openings sealed and the exhaust fan turned off, the clean flow of air from the ventilation blower would build an internal overpressure, stopping radioactive dust from seeping in. This method was fairly limited, though. The blower worked by centrifugal particle separation, and this was completely ineffective against small particles, so the crew still had to don their gas masks in the event of a chemical or biological attack. Also, needless to say, once the main gun was fired and the breech block opened, the crew compartment would begin to lose its overpressure. But regardless, there was no expectation that the crew would be completely protected from inhaling any fallout, because after a shot was fired, an auto-ejector would take the spent casing and eject it from the turret. In a nuclear-contaminated environment, the amount of fallout entering the crew compartment this way was considered acceptable. The nuclear protection system would still accomplish the task of limiting external irradiation, which is the main medical hazard of fallout. Originally, the spent case ejector was developed before nuclear warfare became a major concern for the Soviet Army. In fact, the T-62 inherited its spent case ejector from the D-54TS in Object 140, and this ejector was created before the Army demanded collective radiation protection in combat vehicles. Under normal conditions, a case ejector helped to increase the rate of fire by reducing propellant fume pollution in the turret, and by relieving the loader of the need to manually dispose of spent cases. This was especially important for the D-54TS gun of the Object 140, considering how long its cases were. Retrieving such long cases from the floor to manually throw them out would have been a major nuisance for the loader, and leaving them to roll around the floor was not a solution either. The T-62 was famously armed with the 115mm U-5TS smoothbore tank gun, codenamed Molot. Although the idea of using a smoothbore gun in a tank was not new by the time the T-62 entered service, the U-5TS was the first successful implementation of the smoothbore tank gun concept, which has persisted to this day. The U-5TS was an effective tank gun combining many positive traits in both its primary and secondary characteristics. 
As explored in the previous episode, the U-5TS was derived from the D-54TS, and it was even alleged that the first five guns used for the Object 166 prototype trials were built by refitting existing D-54TS guns with a new barrel. The primary justification for a smoothbore gun is that the nature of the barrel wear with a smoothbore barrel is more conducive to a high-pressure, high-velocity gun firing light ammunition. For all guns, the throat of the barrel experiences the most severe erosion from the heat and pressure of the combustion gases. With rifled barrels, the dispersion of the gun worsens significantly as the rifling lands recede away the seated projectile due to erosion. As such, the accuracy life of a rifled barrel tends to run out sooner as the erosion progresses down the throat, whereas without rifling, the throat can be eroded further and to much greater depth with much less of an impact on dispersion. Although the firepower of the 115mm U5TS smoothbore gun was indisputably its main selling point, for the chief designer of the T62, Leonid Kartsev, who tended to be more concerned with tank design rather than gun design, several of the main advantages were in how it fit into the T62. The weapon in its entirety was around the same size as the 105mm L7 and smaller than the 120mm L11 gun. Although this might not seem very praiseworthy for a gun that was 5mm smaller in caliber, the U5TS incorporated several design solutions that allowed for a compact package to be achieved without compromising other design details. For example, the breech of a gun normally has to grow in size and weight to counterbalance any lengthening of the barrel. For powerful high-velocity guns, this often meant having a massive breech. One method of avoiding this is to put the trunnion further down the barrel, but this makes the gun take up more space in the turret, unless the trunnion is positioned far forward of the turret ring. Another method is to keep the breech small and use a recuperator to artificially balance the gun, like on the M103 heavy tank, but a recuperator takes up space as well. The third solution is to accept the imbalance of the gun and live with it, this was the case for the L7, the L11, and the M68. One reason for this is that maintaining balance would be too difficult anyway with a heavy mantelet ahead of the gun's trunnion, even on tanks with relatively light armor like a Leopard 1. However, this approach meant that the hydraulic gun elevation drive had to run at enormous pressures, which not only added bulk, weight, and heat, but also danger in routine operation and during combat. The solution used on Soviet guns was to take the vertical gun stabilizer and mount it underneath the breech as a ballast. The savings in size were such that the U5TS could have a horizontally sliding breech block while having a breech as narrow as the L11, even though the L11 had a vertically sliding breech block, and its 120mm rounds were straight-walled, unlike the aggressively bottlenecked cases of the 115mm rounds. Aside from the qualities of the gun itself, its ammunition was also worthy of note. Armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo ammunition, or APF-SDS, was the preferred option against hard targets. Two options were initially available, a basic steel rod, and a steel rod with a small tungsten carbide core in the tip. Both rounds were highly potent but the cord round was especially interesting in that it was essentially an overgrown type of APCR round. Its purpose was to match the flat armor penetration of the 100mm APDS fired from a D-54. In practice, flat penetration was irrelevant, but nevertheless, a T-62 could deal a fatal blow to any NATO tank from under 2 kilometers with either of these rounds. Some, like the Leopard 1, could be penetrated from at least 3 kilometers. The weaker zones of these tanks could generally be penetrated from even further, but the exact distance was never given in period documentation, because Soviet analysts stopped counting at 3 kilometers. Heat rounds were also available as an alternative, but although its penetration power was outstanding, reaching 500 millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor on average, scoring a hit at range was difficult due to its modest velocity. For soft targets, field fortifications, and anything else unsuitable for APF, SDS, or heat, there was High Explosive Fragmentation Ammunition, or HE Frag. The T-62 had two-plane gun stabilization, precise enough to hit targets from a kilometer and above on the move. 
The main novelty of the stabilizer is that it had a loader's assist device to make loading the gun easier. After a shot was fired, a sensor detected the recoil of the breech and triggered a special subroutine. The gunner's electric firing trigger was disconnected, turret power traverse would be blocked, and the gun would be locked in elevation. For tanks built in 1965 and onward, the gun would also be automatically elevated to 2.5 degrees before being locked. The gunner could only resume control after the loader pressed an arming switch on the recoil guard next to the gun breech. Keeping the turret from rotating was for the loader's safety and convenience, since almost all of the ammunition in a T-62 was in the hull, and locking the gun at an elevated position made it easier to ram around into the breech. Naturally, despite its merits, having the gun automatically elevate away from a target after every shot would be aggravating, but ultimately this was an optional feature. It was turned on by default, but it could be disabled by pressing the arming switch before the gun was fired. This would engage a mechanical interlock, preventing the sensor from detecting the gun's recoil, so the safety subroutine could not turn on, although it was recommended that the loader's assist be activated in normal circumstances. The T-62 technical manual states that, quote, If, after firing, the gun must be in a stabilized position before loading the next round, then, at the gunner's request, the loader switches on the electric firing circuit by pressing the lever for turning on the firing circuit of the autoblocker. In this case, the gun, removed from hydrolock, automatically enters a stabilized state. For the subsequent loading of the gun, it is necessary to again open the electrical firing circuit, turn off the mechanical interlock, by pressing the button for turning off the firing circuits of the autoblocker. In addition to the 115mm main gun, the T-62 was fitted with an SGMT coaxial machine gun. This was replaced in 1964 by the new PKT machine gun, as part of the Soviet Army's push to standardize the PK as a general-purpose machine gun. The PKT could be fitted onto the existing coaxial mount in the tank, and the two machine guns had barrels of the same length, ensuring that the shots would be ballistically matched. This was done so that the PKT would be easily interchangeable with the SGMT, as there was no need to modify the mount or swap out the glass viewfinder insert in the gunner's sight to account for differing ballistics. The same ammunition belts and 250 round boxes used with the SGMT were also compatible with the PKT. Ten ammunition boxes were available inside the tank, one mounted on the machine gun and the rest scattered in various stowage points in the hull, for a total combat load of 2,500 rounds of ammunition. Like the T-55, the T-62 originally had no anti-aircraft machine gun, but in 1969 it was decided to install the Dushka M anti-aircraft machine gun on T-55, T-55A, and T-62 tanks and their subsequent modifications beginning in May 1970. The new requirement for an anti-aircraft machine gun was driven by combat reports of machine guns being effective against American helicopters in the Vietnam War. The new Dushka M on the T-62 was installed on a new loader's cupola. It was fed with 50 round boxes and had a total ammunition load of 300 rounds, all stowed externally on the side of the turret. In the next episode, we will talk about the T-62's armor, its suspension and drivetrain, and examine what the overall thoughts on the T-62 were from both the USSR and abroad.